Hello, good evening everyone and welcome to Senior Planet. Uh, for those of you that are watching online on our YouTube channel, uh, we're at Senior Planet Exploration Center in Chelsea, New York. We have a very special guest tonight that is going to be talking all about apps. Um, Abby Stokes is a beloved board member and has been a board member of OAT Senior Planet for since the beginning. So we're really thrilled to have here, her here today to talk about apps. And then she's going to also talk about her book. So w give a warm welcome to Abby Stokes, everyone. Hi, everybody. Hi, everybody. I'm going to take this off. I don't know how many of you know the movie Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, but you know in the movie when he asked him to shoot and he can't shoot anything, and he says, now can I move? That's me with a microphone. So I will be sure I'm, I'm, I have to move around a little bit in order to talk. So yes, you are in what I perceive to be hallowed ground. Senior Planet is such an amazing place. This was really, Tom Camber had thought of this for a long time before it came to fruition. So I'm thrilled to be here and you guys are, I think, very lucky to be here. I'm gonna do a little survey in the room. Um, how many people in this room have a smartphone, which means a cell phone you can connect to the internet with, whether it's an iPhone, okay. How many people in the room have an iPad or a tablet of some kind? How many people in the room are on Facebook? How many are on Twitter? How many think it's all a bunch of hooey? All that social networking? Thank you, it's an honest answer, I do too. So I started doing computers more than 20 years ago. Um, I learned how to use a computer when I was working at a law firm and my mother asked me if I could teach her and I thought absolutely not because my mother couldn't change her clock radio when the time changed so how on earth was she going to learn how to use a computer at that time I'd go home and it'd be months before she changed her clock radio until I came to change it for her so she'd have to add or subtract an hour until I got there but my mother taught me something about technology have a seat anywhere you want about technology and that is anybody can learn it if you know the benefit for you that's what makes it appealing to learn I don't think is there anybody in the room under the age of 40 I'm not under the age of 40 we are what I refer to as digital immigrants we were not born with a keyboard or a mouse in our hand that means we digital natives are your grandkids they are four years old, they get on the computer, they're suddenly playing around with stuff you didn't even know existed. I think what makes learning technology unappealing is learning it because you feel like somebody else knows something you don't versus learning it because there's something you know you want to learn that will help you. So I'm gonna ask you to stop comparing yourself to digital natives. You're not as young as they are, you're much smarter than they are. You're certainly much wiser than they are. They just have an aptitude for the technology because they think of it like a toy, because it was part of their life from the very beginning. So that, I think, is one of the hurdles. But that doesn't have so much to do with today. But what I want to do today is I want to talk to you about apps. Um, I'm going to need you to flip my, my film for me. I need my slides moved. Aaron, I need my slide. <laughs> he forgot, he's the man behind the curtain. It's the Wizard of Oz, and he's really the wizard. I'm just the one talking. Um, so there's an app for that, is what we're going to talk about today. If you could do the next slide. Thank you. So when computers first came out, computers had programs on them. You could learn to how, how to speak Spanish. You could write letters. You could do spreadsheets. You could work with uh, photographs. Those are called software programs or software applications. When handheld devices began, like smartphones and tablets, they shortened what programs were called on a smartphone or a tablet, and they called them apps. So when you hear the word, you don't need to know this in order to use it, but when you hear the word apps, it's really just an abbreviation for application, which is an abbreviation for software application, which really means the same thing as software program. So they're just programs that you can put on your phone. So when we look at this, sort of the evolution of technology was that's a laptop or a notebook computer up in the top left. And whenever I say that, I always remember I was, <laughs> I was visiting somebody on a farm up in the Berkshires, and I asked the farmer what the difference was between a pig and a hog, and he said, why you spell it? So I've had many people say to me, what is the difference between a laptop and a notebook computer, that portable computer up there? Really, it's just the way you spell it. They're the same thing. But so people sort of went from desktop computers 
to laptop or notebook computers, and now a lot of people are using tablets instead of using a laptop or notebook computer, and up there are samples of smartphones. So there are two main manufacturers of the smartphones and the tablets, and they go under two names. It's either an Apple product, which is an iPhone or an iPad, or Android products, which are run through Google programs. They're called Androids or Droids. So you have an Android phone or an Android tablet. It's such an unattractive name for something, but that's what it is. <laughs> it's a droid. Anyway, if you could do the next slide for me. So before we go into apps, since we're talking about handheld devices, I wanted to show you this because I, primarily for me the most important thing is that you don't hurt yourself using the technology, right? So this is an example of the toll it takes on you when you look down at your device. And I know a lot of people look down at their device because they think that's the more polite thing to do. They're being more discreet, so they sort of look down at their phone this way. I want to have you hold it up so the phone is eye level with you. Because if you look at this at the far right, if you have your head down 60 degrees, it's the equivalent of six, 60 pounds of weight pulling down on our aging spines. 60 pounds of weight for perspective is like three gallons of paint, right? So just imagine, three. that's because your head weighs a lot as it's pulling down. Yes, exactly, we want to go that way. Even when you're, I mean, your head weighs between 10 and 12 pounds to begin with. So even when you're just at 15 degrees, it increases it to 27 pounds, which is the equivalent of a gallon, you know, a little bit more than a gallon of paint. So I want you to think, when you're using your phone or your, or your tablet, I want you to hold it up in front of you. If you're sitting down and you're using your tablet on your lap, when you're on your sofa, just get some pillows and put some pillows underneath the tablet to raise it up. Or there are even those nice little desks that actually pivot that you can put it on. But you just want to get out of that habit. I, I recently got a gym membership. And this 20-year-old kid said to me after he did sort of the evaluation, he said, well, your hump isn't so bad. And I said, I can I give you some advice? Don't ever tell a woman she has a hump. Um, but, you know, it's just not polite. But he said, well, no, no, I'm so, I shouldn't say it because 16, 17-year-old kids, their humps are much worse than yours. 16, 17-year-old kids because they've grown up facing down at these devices. So this is a really important piece of information for you to share with younger people that you know because they're going to have a much harder time than we are. If you could do the next slide, please. Thank you. So <laughs> the three little birds are chatting with each other, and they say, he has Wi-Fi to the one bird over there. I put that up there because that was also the innovation that really changed what made it capable for us to use these handheld devices that we use apps on. So when Wi-Fi came out, things didn't have to be plugged in in order for us to access the internet. So your smartphone or your tablet is able to connect to the internet, visit websites, send photographs, do email, often because spots have Wi-Fi, or with those devices, you're paying a company, AT&T, Sprint, T-Mobile, Verizon, a monthly fee to be able to have your device go to their satellite to get the signal to then connect to the internet. So at Senior Planet, there's Wi-Fi. So if you came in here, you could, you could feed off of the Wi-Fi. But if you had a smartphone or a tablet and you're walking down the streets of Manhattan, Manhattan's not the best example because there's so much Wi-Fi you can feed into. So let's say you're in Nebraska <laughs> and you're on, a, you know, you're on your bicycle going from farm to farm. You're not going to have Wi-Fi from point A to point B. So that's when you're going to pay a monthly fee to make sure that you've got signal coming to your device. A small coda to that is if you haven't bought yourself a tablet and you're thinking of buying yourself a tablet, ask the question, is it Wi-Fi only, or does it work with Wi-Fi and a cellular data plan? A cellular data plan is paying Verizon, Sprint, or T-Mobile a monthly fee for their signal. Because if you buy a tablet for the lower price, they're usually a little less expensive, that only offers Wi-Fi, it means if you are someplace where there isn't Wi-Fi, you're not going to have any kind of a signal. And I know people have bought the lower price points because they're appealing and then discover that they actually couldn't use it in other places. So make sure that it has the capability for both. Even if you don't activate the cellular data, you'll probably want to have the capability. If you could do the next slide. So 
on your smartphone or your tablet, there's going to be an icon that represents the app store for the device that you have. So these are the three samples. The one in the top left is if you have an Apple device. The one on the far right is if, and this is much more rare if you're using a Microsoft device. And the one down here is if you have a Google or an Android device. So if you've never looked at the App Store on your phone, look for one of those symbols. It's interesting, if you don't know if you have an Android or an Apple phone, you're gonna find out when you look at the symbol because you're gonna know it's an Apple phone if it's the A, you're gonna know it's an Android if it looks like this little colorful pyramid here. So take a look and find the App Store. When you tap on the App Store, if you've never used it before, if you try to add something to your phone or to your tablet, it's going to ask you for your credit card information. Now, I am a good Connecticut Yankee, and I don't pay for stuff like that. So when we talk about apps, all of the apps that I'm going to show you and the apps that are in the handout that I gave you are all free. I do not cotton to paying anything for an app. 99 cents I won't even do. Some of them are much more expensive than that. But the App Store is going to ask you to put in your credit card information in anticipation that you might want to purchase an app. So you can't add free apps onto your device without putting in that credit card information. So don't let it throw you off. If your intention is to never pay for an app, they're still gonna ask you to put your credit card information in. And if you're uncomfortable with putting your credit card information in, which I understand, instead of using the credit card that you use all the time, you might get a secondary credit card, one that you can actually put $20 on, $100 on it, so that you know nobody can abuse it because it can only use up whatever the total is on the card. I, there's a name for them. They're, I don't know how they distinguish it, but you can call up the credit card companies and they will let you get a credit card that you actually put an amount on and it can't be used for more than that. That protects you from having the credit card you're used to using be compromised in some way. Does that make sense to you guys? So I know a lot of people don't like listing their credit card. If you don't like listing your credit card, it means that you're not gonna be able to take apps from the App Store, but we're also gonna review some apps that are already on your phone for free that you're probably not using. So you probably have enough to play with without adding anything to your phone, but you might get tempted once you see what else you can add for free to just put in your credit card information anyway. When you go to the App Store, they're going to have lists of apps by categories. Within those lists, they're gonna have one category called free. That's always where I look. I don't look at anything else, but if you want games, if you want sports, if you want health, if you want science, they're gonna have them listed that way. If somebody's told you about some apps, like I will, and on your printout, there's also gonna be a little magnifying glass. And you can tap on that magnifying glass and you can type in the name of the app you've heard of and then it will come up on the screen for you. So you can either go with their lists or you can type and search for what it is that you're looking for. If you could go to the next slide. Thank you. So I'm going to give you my favorite app. It's called Sit or Squat. Charmin sponsors the app and it tells you, it finds where you are. If your location services are turned on, your phone actually can tell apps where you are. You might not want that. But in this case, if your location services are turned on, Sit or Squat will actually find where you are and tell you where the nearest public toilets are, and people will have reviewed them. And I know for some people that's, but if you live in New York City, that's actually a very handy thing to have. So that is, that's the first one. And again, it's one of those, it's free, there are probably gonna be advertisements for Charmin because they're sponsoring Sitter Squad. It's actually really well designed because people can give their feedback about what kind of toilets it is that they went to visit. Um, other apps that are free, the price you pay is advertising, right? So you're going to have it be that something's probably gonna pop up on the screen. To get rid of it, you're gonna look for that little X in the top right corner. Sometimes it'll disappear on its own, but if it doesn't, just look for that X in the top right corner and click on it, and the advertisement will, will sift away. I don't get put off by ads because it's free. Television used to, as we remember. TV was free, and there were advertisements. I never, I, I got rid of my television set in 2001, and I've never paid for cable television because when I watched cable TV at a friend's house, I knew how much they were paying by the month, 
and there are still ads. So I don't know how we got rooked into that deal, because if you're going to pay for cable television, we shouldn't have ads anyway. In this case, you will have ads when you use free apps, more often than not. Um, be cautious with advertising. When you watch your television set at home, and an advertisement comes up, a commercial comes up and says, you need to lose 10 pounds. And you look at the TV set and you go, they don't know me. Well, maybe you do need to lose 10 pounds, but they don't know you need to lose 10 pounds. So you get up and you go to the kitchen during the commercial break and you get a bag of potato chips and you come back to eat them because how do they know you need to lose 10 pounds? You have a built-in filter to discriminate about what is a commercial when you're watching television because you're used to it. It tends to be that we digital immigrants, when we're using technology, we tend to be more polite and more cautious and more fearful. That is one of the big differences between digital immigrants and digital natives. So I'm going to empower you to use the same discrimination when you're watching the television set and you know it's a commercial. If something pops up on the screen before you panic because it's telling you your computer needs more something or your storage is compromised or whatever it is, look at it and say, is this an ad? How do they know that about me? They probably don't know that about you and it probably is a pop-up ad, especially when you're looking at one of the free apps. So again, you're just gonna not tap on anything there except if there's an X in the top right corner to make that advertisement go away. If I could have the next slide, thank you. So I want to review with you some of the travel apps that I really like. And it's interesting because travel is such a relative term. You could be traveling, you could be in a foreign place traveling there, traveling to get to the foreign place, or sometimes New York City is its foreign place unto itself. And sometimes having a travel app just to get around the city is helpful. So I'm going to walk you through some of those. The next slide. Thank you. Who here has used the GPS on their phone or tablet? I love it. I've used it in New York many times. I've, I've spoken at now 175 libraries across the country, and I think I've spoken at every library on the island of Manhattan and almost every library in the boroughs around it. But uh, I have to be honest, like Staten Island, I hadn't been to till I went to do, I'd been on the ferry back and forth when it was hot, when I didn't have an air conditioner, but I haven't actually been on to Staten Island until, it used to be 25 cents and you could go back and forth and back and forth, but I hadn't been on the island until I went to one of the libraries and it, I could have been in a foreign country. I had no idea where I was going and it was the GPS on my phone that helped me figure out how to get to the library. So you don't have to be going that far away in order to take advantage of the GPS. So here are three examples because there are often more than one app that does the job. Often there are apps that work on both Apple products and on Android products. There are some that only work on one or the other. And some people have favorites and it's going to change between us um, just to sort of circle around that. I don't know how many, pe how many people in here have an Apple computer? How many people in here have a Microsoft computer? Okay, how many people who have a Microsoft computer have been told by their grandchildren they should be getting an Apple computer? <laughs> yeah, right? So here's my philosophy on that. You do not wear the same shoes as your grandchildren, right? What fits you, fits you. I use both. I'm Switzerland, I own both, I use both pretty equally. I will tell you, neither is better than the other. They both have huge mistakes that I wouldn't make if I were de designing them themselves. And when they say it's user friendly, that is just very, very good marketing. None of it is user friendly, and none of it, frankly, is intuitive to those of us that are digital immigrants. So just sort of wash that away. So when it comes to, gee, should I be, if I have an Apple computer, should I get an iPhone and an iPad, the Apple products? Or can I get an Android because it's less expensive and still be able to use it with my Apple computer? And the answer is, you can get anything that suits you. Apple products speak better to Apple products because they're the same family. Android products, a Google product will speak better with a Google Chrome computer because they're of the same family, but they can talk to the Apple products. They don't make it as easy as it can be, but they can. So I want you, when you're looking at these devices, to think about the price points that is better for you than whether or not somebody else is telling you to get a more expensive product because they think it's sexier or they work better. Yes.
Right. So for those of you on YouTube, you probably couldn't hear what she just said, so I'm going to try to paraphrase it as quickly as I can. So her point is that it's a compatibility issue. She had heard that Apple products aren't compatible with other things, and in many ways they're not, but you can make them work together because so much, this is conceptually a little hard to think of, but so much of what we do now lives on the cloud that gets access not really because it lives on the device, but because you have to access it through the internet. So if that's the case, even if it's, even if it's your iCloud account that you want to access, you can access it from a non-Apple device because it's living out there. You said something else that I think is interesting. It's this elitist sort of tone that happens when people have Apple products. It's the Hatfields and the McCoys. Right? That's really what it is. And so people who love their Apple products love them and think it's the only way to go. They are designed beautifully. Visually, they're designed beautifully. Are they designed beautifully from a user point of view? No, they're not. And I can give you 10 reasons why an Apple product is no more beautifully designed from a user point of view than a Microsoft product. And in turn, I can tell you 10 things wrong with a Microsoft product. But I will tell you as an expert in the field, they are not in a user way any better. They are beautifully designed. And people who love them love them, and I love mine. But I also happily use Microsoft products. The more important thing is don't let somebody make you feel diminished because you're not using an Apple product or convince you that they are at a very high price point. And there's no reason for you to spend that money if it's not comfortable for you just to meet somebody else's sort of standard if what you have is working. What I will say is this. If you have a smartphone, whether it's an Apple phone or an Android phone, and you want to get a tablet. It's a seamless transition if you buy the same kind of tablet as your phone. Because really all it is is a bigger version of your phone. So why not have those two things be of the same you know, family, if you will, so that it's easier for you to use both of them together. Often when I'm asked this question, what is it that you should be buying, Apple or Microsoft? And the truth is, who's going to help you on a Sunday afternoon when you need help? If your kid is trying to convince you to buy an Apple product, but they're not the one that's going to help you learn how to use it, but your neighbor has a Microsoft product, you might want to get a Microsoft product, or vice versa. If you know your kid's convincing you should stay with Microsoft, but it's really your neighbor at Sunday afternoon when you're confused who's going to help you, you want to get the product that you know you can get help with more than the product that somebody's trying to push you into getting. Yes? Casper the front. Casper. Easier. So her question is, what is Casper the Friendly Ghost up there? I, I will now get to the point of these apps on the, on the screen. So these are three different GPS apps. The one in the left is Google Maps. This is the um, Apple Maps. And the one at the top is Waze, W-A-Z-E. And so they all have very similar ways huh, that they work. What happens is it detects where you are. You put in the address of where you want to go, and a map will come up, much like this map. So at the top there, along the very top line, if you can't read that, the very top line says your location. So the phone found my location. Again, that was only because location services, which is in your settings, is turned on. Some people turn off location services for privacy reasons, and you can decide which app it is turned on or turned off with, because you might not want location services turned on with everything. I'm spinning away again for just a moment. Why wouldn't you? Because if you take a photograph with location services on, the location and time of that photograph is embedded in the photo. And some people don't want that information to be available when they send that photo off. So in this case, my location services is turned on to use my GPS. Up there it says your location, and then below that I typed 15 Lime Street. It's actually where I grew up. And so the map appears, and this represents where I am, and this represents where I'm going, and it actually tells me it's going to take me 14 minutes if I am driving a car. It'll also tell you how long it will take you if you're walking, it will tell you how long it will take you and what form of public transportation to take should you be in an area with public transportation. So for those of us in New York City, you might not think you need to map your path, except it will feed into 
the public transportation, and nine times out of 10, it's up to date. If there's a problem with a particular subway, it will actually show you which one will get you there faster. If you have a choice of taking the L or going up to 42nd Street and taking the shuttle across, it'll actually guide you that way. So your GPS can be very helpful here in the city trying to get you around with public transportation. They also, if you can see this, those little gray lines, those represent alternate routes that you could tap on and have it guide you there. This is on a main highway, the blue, but if I didn't want to go on the main highway, I could tap on one of the other routes and it would actually take me on one of the other routes. Um, and down here it tells you it's 14 minutes, it's 8.6 miles away. At this phase, I would tap on this circle and then the phone would proceed to follow me so on the screen, I would actually see the movement of my little blue circle as it moves along the roads of this 8.6 mile journey that I'm on, and it talks to you, which is genius. So you're, I call her Betty. I've always, <laughs> it's Betty whenever she talks to me. I have conversations with her. She doesn't answer back except about the travel route, but Betty, in my case, will tell me in 300 feet you're going to turn left. Or you know, she'll give you a lead up so that you know that it's coming up. I don't, we're going to be very strict about this with cars, when I'm driving the car, I have my GPS in a stand on the car. I generally listen and try not to look at it. Um, you want to be sure if you're driving a car, you're not distracted by the GPS. But for those of us walking or figuring out, it's kind of a great thing to do. So Waze, people are real fans. The one you referred to as Casper, the friendly ghost, the one up in the top right. Waze is very good at telling you which is the fastest route. So Waze is constantly refreshing itself and finding out if there's a car accident or if there's a traffic jam or if something's happened with a you know pipe has burst or something. So Waze usually can get you there faster. It might be an unconventional route that it takes you on, but usually it gets there faster. So a lot of people, this will already be installed on your Android. This will already be installed on your iPhone. That Waze is something you're going to have to go to the App Store on your phone, and you're going to have to add it, but it is free. And there are advertisements. Um, but it is very helpful. So we, you know, I use all three of them. Sometimes I use one. Sometimes I use the other. You can use just one of them. It, the it, Waze works with both Android and the iPhone. Everything I'm showing you works on both an Android phone and an iPhone. Yes. She just said she can understand how useful it can be in exotic Staten Island. And those of you on YouTube that don't understand that, Staten Island's just a bridge away. Yes, <laughs> it's not even a bridge, a ferry. Yes. I'll repeat this for you guys waiting to hear. I will answer your question before you finish it. Right, I just got back from two and a half weeks in Greece. I use my GPS every day. I use my GPS, but I'm gonna make some caveats to that. So, in a foreign country, you have to first establish what you're doing with your phone, with your, who you're paying for the service. What you don't ever want to do is bring your smartphone to a foreign country and not talk to your provider to find out what it is you should be paying. With uh, AT&T, you can pay $10 a day, and your phone can function as it always does. I can get unlimited text, unlimited data. I can make phone calls. That's AT&T's program. I don't know what it is with Verizon and Sprint, but before you go to a foreign land, you want to first establish with your server that you're going away, and how much will this cost me? Because for other programs, I know data, which means emails and visiting websites, and texts can be free, but phone calls, they may still be charging you for. So here's how you get around it. The first thing is, when you are leaving the country and you're going to the foreign land, you're going to go into your settings and you're going to turn off what is called your cellular data roaming. 
and the roaming is what your phone regularly on its own says, let's go see if Abby has any text messages. Let's go see if she has any emails, right? It's roaming for you on a regular basis. When you turn off the roaming, it means that your phone will only go to grab your emails when you tell it you want to look at your emails. So that way it's not always searching, it's not always roaming because that uses up a lot of data. You, you're going to put your phone in airplane mode when you get on the airplane or turn it off, right? Think of airplane mode as the way to be sure you don't overspend when you're traveling overseas. When you are not in a Wi-Fi area, turn your phone into airplane mode. That way no signal can come in or go out of your phone. There's no chance that you're going to accidentally check your email and have it cost you a gajillion dollars or make some phone calls. So airplane mode cuts off incoming or outcoming signals. Once you get to a Wi-Fi area, which could be your hotel, it could be lots of cafes, McDonald's always has a Wi-Fi spot, lots of places have free Wi-Fi now, then you can turn your phone into onto the Wi-Fi and you can feed off their Wi-Fi signal and whatever you're doing is free. It's not using your cellular data, it's using the Wi-Fi in the area that you're in. The glitchy part is exactly what you asked about. I'm in Paris and I want to go from my hotel to the Eiffel Tower. I want to GPS it with my phone. If I haven't paid for a, pr there won't be Wi-Fi between where I am in my hotel and the Eiffel Tower. So if I haven't paid for a program where I'm able to have my phone use the data in an unlimited way for not more money, I don't want to use the GPS on my phone while I'm doing that walk. So that's the first part of the conversation happens with whoever your service provider is. And if you opt to not take their plan, don't use the GPS when you're not in a Wi-Fi area because it will then gobble up your data. The whole time it's getting a signal in order to make that, you've taken two steps, now you're at the crosswalk, now take a left. This is complex, but what you can do is, if you anticipate where you're going, in Paris, my hotel to the Eiffel Tower, my hotel to the Tuileries Gardens, whatever it is, you can do the searches here. You can put in the address of your hotel. You can put in the address of your destination. You can get the map to come up on your phone. And then you can do something called a screen grab. And a screen grab is that you literally take a picture of what is on your phone's screen. And it goes into your photographs. And that picture of the walk will be waiting for you whether your phone is in airplane mode or not. It's just a picture. So you can store maps that you self-create by using the GPS, the start destination type. You don't want to know what it's like to walk from here to the Eiffel Tower. That would be very confusing and very long. You're going to put in the origin. The first spot is your hotel. And you're going to put in the name of the restaurant that you know you're going to that night. You can do it while you're sitting in New York. The picture comes up of the map, and you do a screen grab of the map. Now, I know on an iPhone, you do a screen grab by holding down the button on the top right and holding down the circle at the bottom. When you hold those down simultaneously, you hear a click and it actually takes a picture of your screen. I cannot remember what it is in an Android, but it's inside my book. So at some point I will be able to find that answer for you. You can email me that question, but I know in an Android you can do a screen grab as well. But anyway, we'll get back to, we'll, I'll solve that afterwards. So the GPS is something that I think if you've never used it on your phone, just test it tonight. When you leave here, open up one of the apps for the GPS and put in your home address and see what it tells you with public transportation or with walking of how you should get home. I think you're going to fall in love with using the GPS once you've tried it. I've actually used it for people who stopped me on the street, tourists who've been lost, and I didn't actually know exactly where they were going, and I would use the GPS on my phone and then show them how they were supposed to get there. So I think you'll find it to be very handy. Can you do the next slide for me? Thank you. If you're driving, I feel very strongly about this. My sister was hit by somebody who was texting. She survived, but it was very bad. And he got out of his car after his car had flipped on the highway, holding his iPhone in his hand and said, it was a new phone, I just couldn't resist. He was in shock. Yeah, if my sister hadn't been in shock, <laughs> he would have had to worry about much more than his phone at that moment. So I am a firm believer that you do not use your phone for anything except the GPS when you're driving. 
you don't, if somebody texts you, if the phone rings, we have the advantage because we grew up without answering machines. I remember sitting at the dining room table and the phone would ring and ring and ring and my dad wouldn't let us pick it up even though we were sitting there. Younger people have a much harder time putting down the phone or not responding to it when they're in a car. So I always suggest that you put it in airplane mode or you turn off the sound or you put it in the glove box. Just get it away so it's not tempting to look at that text message. To read a text message usually takes between four and six seconds. And just as an example, I'm gonna ask you all to close your eyes and I'm gonna to count to four. One, two, three, four. Would Open your eyes. Would you be comfortable having your eyes closed for that long while you're driving? That's exactly what happens when you're texting. You think you're looking, but you're not. Your eyes may as well be closed. So I am a real proponent of not using the phone while you're driving. Next. So here, again, these are travel apps, but when you're in New York City, they're very handy apps. This is all about food. So the one in the left there is Yelp. Yelp is a website. You can use it on your computer, and that's very true for most apps. They also have compatible websites. Yelp, you can put in the neighborhood you're looking for, the kind of food you're looking for, the price point that you're looking for, and these places will be reviewed. I was in Austria with my goddaughter, who had won an award for a documentary, and we were early going to this airport that we were leaving from. And I said, we should stop someplace near an airport. You know, it's a disaster because the food's always miserable. We should just look at Yelp and see whether or not there's a decent restaurant. There was the sweetest, quaintest waitresses and dirndls and like great schnitzel. It was fabulous and it was on Yelp and I never would have found it if I hadn't looked. So Yelp is really helpful. It's helpful in New York as well. You know, you're in a neighborhood and you're not quite sure where you want to go. Look at the reviews on Yelp. You can in turn also review on Yelp to help other people know what restaurants you had good or bad experiences with. This bottom one is the image for Open Table. Open Table is also a website where you can make reservations for restaurants that you want to go to. Very specifically, rather than calling on the phone and waiting on hold, you can actually go again. They let you sort restaurants by the kind of food and by the neighborhood. And then you can make your reservation and you actually accrue points through open table. So eventually you have, I think I have a $50 gift certificate waiting for me with open table for the number of times that I use them to make a reservation. And it doesn't cost you anything. The restaurants are paying open table to do this, so it makes it easier for them. So I highly recommend visit open table even on the computer to make a reservation. This one is called check please and then the word light, L-I-T-E, check, please, light. And this is one of my favorites. I was always the person, if a bunch of us were having dinner out, I'm the one that had to figure out the math on how much we're gonna tip, and then if we're gonna tip, how much it is that we each have to give. It is an app that lets you put in the total of the bill, you decide the percentage of the tip that you wanna give, and then you break it down by the number of people sitting at the table and it calculates you for you what everybody should be putting into the check. So it's check please L-I-T-E light and you will love it. The other way to get away from having to pay for your dinner at all is I now have a little habit when I go to a restaurant with friends of mine. I have everybody put their phone in the center of the table and the person who reaches for their phone first has to pick up the check. Right? If you're sick of having people pick up their phones while you're eating, start to institute that rule when you sit down at a restaurant. And it is remarkable how people suddenly don't have to use their phone if they're the one that has to pick up the check. Just a, my little tip. I also, when people come to a dinner party, I have an empty wine um, ice bucket. And people all put their phones into the bucket before we sit down to dinner. If you could do the next slide, please. So these are apps that some of them are automatically on your phone and some of them are the most basic ones that I would add. So I'll just start at the top left. I Translate is what it sounds like. It's a free, all of these are free. It's an app where you can either speak into the app or type in the app something in English and choose the language that it's gonna translate it into for you. It, or you could start out with Portuguese and have it translated into Italian. You could start out with Spanish and have it translated into English. You think this is for people who are traveling overseas. 
but I had the loveliest man come and wash the windows in my apartment not so long ago, a very nice Polish guy whose English wasn't so fabulous, and I wanted to offer for him if he wanted to have a glass of water because it was so hot, and I didn't know how to say it, and I, so I typed it on iTranslate, and I held my phone up. He was on the other side of the window, which is probably not a good idea on my part, but I did it anyway, and I held it up, and I have to say he laughed so hard that it was in Polish I was afraid he was going to fall off the windowsill, but I was able to ask him if he wanted a glass of water by just putting into I translate. So I translate isn't just for you when you're in a foreign country. It can often, you can do it in a restaurant to just translate something on the menu that you didn't know what it was. So I, I love I translate. My goddaughter, the one who did the documentary, she's actually in Middlebury this summer doing a Portuguese intensive. And I was determined to not speak English to her, so I haven't called her. But the text messages and the emails, I would put them into I translate long text messages or long emails. It would translate the whole thing, and I could copy and paste it into an email and send it off to her, having her think that I was much smarter than I am. Although I think she didn't fall for it. I think she knew exactly what I was doing. The clock. It seems so fundamental, right? Your phone, your smartphone, or your tablet has a clock. Your clock has so many more functions than you realize. I have my phone set right here on a timer for an hour and 20 minutes, so I know when I should be winding up the talk. There's a stopwatch on your clock. There's a world clock on your clock so that you're able to, you can choose different time zones all over the world that you want to put into your phone so you can see what the time is in different places. There is a, an alarm on your phone that you can set to wake you up. One thing I will say, when you set the alarm on your phone, make sure, especially if it's overnight, make sure you can still turn the volume off. You can silence your phone, and the alarm will still sound in the morning. I know a lot of people set the alarm, and they purposely don't silence their phone, and then all night long they hear the bings of text coming in. Very frustrating, not a good night's sleep. But you can actually silence your phone, and it will sound when it's time for the alarm to go off in the morning, so you don't have to worry about it. So I would say, if you're feeling a little intimidated by your smartphone or your tablet, the first app I would play with is the clock. Because there's so many things in there that are helpful and that are kind of familiar, it's going to seem like common ground for you if you should go into that. Over on the left-hand side, who here has used Skype? So some of you have. So Skype basically lets your computer, your smartphone, or your tablet, it suddenly becomes that you can do video conferencing or video calling. You don't have to use the video part of it, but you can. And it's free. As long as you have a Wi-Fi signal or a strong enough signal to use it, Skype doesn't cost anything. But if you're traveling and your phone service doesn't give you a good deal for making long-distance calls, initiate your account with Skype. You're going to have to give them an email address. You're going to have to create a password. Put in money into your Skype account. I went to Germany for two weeks. My mom was here in the US. I didn't, at that time, I wasn't using AT&T. I didn't have a good program of $10 a day. I put money into my Skype account, and I would talk to her for, four, I put $10 in. And I would talk to her for 45 minutes on the phone, not using the Skype free Wi-Fi thing, but when I was away from Wi-Fi on the phone. And it would cost a couple of dollars for the phone call. So if you don't have an option and you're traveling overseas, a good deal, putting money, Skype can go from, if you're doing it from device to device, somebody has a smartphone, my mom didn't, or somebody has a tablet or somebody has a computer, you don't need to use the money part of it. But if you're calling somebody who doesn't have a smartphone or a tablet or a computer, then you can actually use the Skype account that you put money in to make those phone calls. Otherwise, it's all free. And it's fantastic. It's so handy. You know, you've, you've just redecorated your bedroom and you want to show somebody who lives across the country, you just... Skype them on the phone, and you can walk around. Apple also offers FaceTime, which is the equivalent of Skype. Skype is universal because it, it works on all platforms, and it's free. So whatever device you have, Skype is going to work on it. Units, I love units. Units basically translates everything, whether it's meters to miles, it's inches to whatever, it's tablespoons to huh, all that stuff that you need to have converted. You can go, it's also does a currency converter. So if you're traveling, you can always use the currency converter on it. So if there's anything that you need to translate that way to, to 
um, convert that way. Units is the best app that I've ever found because it has every possible different unit that you want to change. The Weather Channel. There are free weather apps out there. Some of them are much more specific where they actually have like Doppler radar and you can look at the radar of things. If you haven't played around with it, again, I think the weather app is one of those fun apps to play with because we're all kind of interested in the weather. You can set the weather so that it actually looks at weather in several different places for you because whether you're traveling there or whether somebody you know lives there, you can check out their weather. You can set it up so that it gives you alerts. So again, I just think as, as simple, friendly things to play with, it sort of has universal appeal. Playing with the weather app is a good idea. The camera. The camera on your phone. I have never liked taking photographs. I take crummy pictures, and I generally feel like it sort of removes me from the moment I'm in. But there are times that the camera really comes in handy. You've parked your car in a big old garage, and you don't think you're going to remember that it's section B, space 112. Take a picture of where your car is. I travel a lot, and I've got rental cars. I often will take a picture of the car <laughs> because I won't remember what the car is or the driver's, you know, the license plate on it. Um, sometimes I've, I've taken pictures of the door at a hotel. You know, they give you the key, but no longer is the number on the key for safety reasons. And sometimes I'll take a picture of the door to my hotel room so I won't forget the number. So don't think of the camera as something that you only use in order to document an activity or something like that. I use the, I'll be in a, in a store and I'll find a dress that I really love and I'll wonder whether or not I can find it cheaper online and I'll take a picture of the tag and a picture of the dress and then I'll search online to see if I can see something similar to it or the same thing for less. So be adventurous with using the camera. Um, before we go on to the next slide, I'm just gonna take a second, yes. So his question is, with Skype and FaceTime, the person that you're communicating with, do they have to have the same program? Yes, they do. So if you're, other than that phone call, other than you using it to make a phone call to somebody who has no device, and that's what costs money, but to do Skype, the other person has to have Skype on their device. FaceTime is obviously limiting because it's only on Apple devices. So if you know you're FaceTiming, you want to connect with somebody who doesn't have an Apple product, then you're going to see whether or not they have Skype and not FaceTime, because FaceTime is only for Apple. Any other questions before I go on? So, yes? Okay, so you have Skype, and I, I'm, I'm translating this for people on YouTube that can't hear you. So you have Skype, but it's costing you $30 a year, but you're using it to call people that don't have Skype. So you're using it as a long-distance phone carrier. Yes. So you can, and that's when it costs money with Skype. But if somebody you were trying to reach in Canada or Mexico had a smartphone, a tablet, or a computer, and they put Skype onto that, it would be free between the two of you. But if you're using it as a phone, because they only have a phone for you to call, that's when it costs you money. But it's still relatively inexpensive. Yeah, relatively speaking. Any other questions before we go on? Okay, next one. So, let's talk about money with your apps. My sister won't bank online. My sister didn't want to get an easy pass because she figured Big Brother knew where she was going. My sister has issues with shopping online and using her credit card, and you know what? If you do too, good for you. One should never do what makes them uncomfortable, even if other people are doing it. So if you don't want to shop online, there are lots of brick and mortar stores that are very happy for you to come into them. If you don't want to use your phone for banking online, you certainly don't have to. However, I will tell you it's kind of a miracle. Outside of it actually spitting money out at you, which I wish it could do, but it can't, you can check your balance in a flash whenever you want to. I still have a check register. I go online to balance my check register because I don't get printed bank statements anymore. But I do every month, I, I balance my check register. If you were talking to a younger person, they don't have check registers anymore. Um, I went to Germany, and in my wallet, I meant to mail my rent check before I left, but I forgot to. 
I got online and I was able to pay my rent online so it wouldn't be late before I came home. Even better, I had a couple of checks that I meant to deposit and I forgot to deposit them and they mattered. They were what were covering the rent. I discovered with the phone, if I had an app for my bank, you could actually take, you sign the back of the check and write down your bank's very specific. It probably says remote deposit for Bank of America or whatever it is you're using. Sign the bank at back of your check, put down your um, account number. You take a picture of the front of the check, you flip it over, you take a picture of the back of the check, and then you fill in which account it's going to and how much is going in, and then you'll get an email confirming that that deposit was made. I always write on the check, deposited remotely with the date so that I keep that check until I see it's cleared and it's in the bank account. But you can actually make deposits, not of cash, but deposits with checks using your phone. So I think you might want to venture forth in looking at your banking phone app. Um, the one in the top right corner is the icon for Venmo, V-E-N-M-O. Venmo is an app that allows you, should you be sitting at dinner, and you were the one that picked up the phone in the middle of the table, and so now you have to pick up the check for everybody, but you didn't bring enough cash, and so Martha sitting next to you paid the $30 for you. You could pick up your phone and use Venmo, and Venmo will send Martha, if she has a Venmo account, $30 right there and then. So people use Venmo a lot to just reimburse each other. Or if you've got kids or grandkids and you want to send them a little gift, you can just send them money on Venmo and then they can, if there's a slight fee when you move the money from Venmo into your bank account, I can't remember what the percent is, but there is a slight fee for that. But if you keep the money in Venmo and just sort of keep passing it back and forth between people, you don't pay a fee for that. So I use Venmo to reimburse people if I'm sitting at dinner or if they lent me money for something else. You might want to experiment with that depending on whether or not that's something that you end up doing very often if you're not carrying cash on you. It's interesting, younger people don't carry cash. It's all plastic, you know. I always have a $20 bill somewhere because I feel like, I always had a dime inside my loafers. Like I always feel like I have to have some money with me, but they don't. Um, when you're banking online, and you're establishing your ID. Sometimes the bank will give you an ID, but if you get to establish your ID, which means the name that you sign in with, and then you're gonna have to choose a password, and then they might even have a third point of security that they're gonna pass you through, just remember, you'd, even though it's easy for you, don't have your banking ID just be your name. Because the point of the ID is, it's the first point of entry for somebody to get into your account. And to have it be, which it always was my name until I did its talk with a security guy and he said, that's ridiculous. I no longer have my name be the ID. I do something else that's just a little bit more obscure, not too hard for me to remember, but something a little bit more obscure because you don't want to make it that easy for the person to pass through the first doorway of security. Does that make sense to you? Your username, exactly right. Right. Well, I'm going to stop you now only because the people on YouTube can't hear you. I know what you're getting at. Here's the thing with banking. Again, only do what you're comfortable with, but whether you bank walking into a bank, whether you bank using a computer, or whether you bank on your phone, it is all FDIC insured. So should something happen to your money in your bank because somebody accessed your phone, it would be the same thing as somebody robbing the bank. You are insured for that should it come to pass. It doesn't mean you should do it. I want you to do what's comfortable for you. If you're not comfortable banking online, absolutely don't fight with people about it, just don't do it. You don't have to do it. Your investor guy wants you to do it, tough, let him do it. You don't have to do it. It's only with what you're comfortable with. I'm just gonna go on because we're limited with time and then if there are questions afterwards, I'll come back to you. If you go to the next slide, please. Great, this is sort of a random mishmash of apps. Um, on the left-hand side, that little star and what above it is the app equivalent with a Fitbit. You don't have to have a Fitbit in order to use their app. You can track your activity. You can look at their videos for exercises. You can track you know, what your caloric intake is. There are all these different things you can use 
the Fitbit app for even if you're not wearing that thing around your wrist. Um, I think any, uh, there are many free apps that you can use for fitness stuff. There are some that have really good exercise videos, some that just have kind of every day an inspirational thing to remind you to do your exercises. Some have alarms that cue you up if you haven't been doing enough walking. Um, actually, somebody said that you can change your passwords to be aspirational so you remember your goals. So rather than having your password be, you know, capital X Q594, it could say eat less sugar. <laughs> so every day you sign into your email and you have to type the words eat less sugar. I kind of thought it was genius. Like it would remind me, okay, I take another walk. Um, at the top, I love this app, those two little people holding hands. That's find your friends. And what that means is somebody has to say yes to this, but I, my, if my sister's driving from Connecticut to New York, she won't text me, and she shouldn't, and she shouldn't call me, but if she gets stuck in traffic, and I'm wondering where is she and how much longer is it gonna take to her to get here, we activate Find My Friends, and so I'm able to look on my phone, and I'm like, oh, she's on 34th Street. Great, I'm gonna now stand on 14th Street and hold that parking spot for her where people will yell at me for doing it, but so be it. Um, or she hasn't even left Connecticut, there must be a traffic jam or an accident of some kind. I've had my goddaughters, when they were younger, I would put this on when they were walking around New York City so I could tell where they were going. Nobody can use Find Your Friends without you approving it, so nobody's going to be watching you without them asking to be able to do it. But I actually think it's a, when we were on vacation, and we were on vacation and I just wanted, you know, it's hard, I don't know where I am, how can I tell somebody where I am when I'm someplace? It was easy to use the Find Your Friends app and be able to track them on the phone. So it's something that depending on who it is, you know, you want to follow, it might be worth your having. Temp stick is an example for you. I have a little cottage in Connecticut. There's always somebody base, somebody's basement floods or somebody's heat goes off. Temp stick actually works in conjunction with my house. So I have it set that should the temperature in my house go below 50 or go above 90, I will get a, a notice on my phone. So I could be anywhere in the world, and if the temperature in my house goes below 50 or goes above 90, I get a notification on my phone and then I can call a neighbor and have them go check and see if the heat is broken or somehow the house has gotten too warm. Obviously with the temperature that it's been recently above 90 is not such a surprise. I also have another device in my basement that sits on the floor, and if that device gets wet, my phone goes off. So if there's some reason there's a leak in my basement, before it floods all the way, I'll get a notification and I can send somebody over. So I'm telling you that because there are lots of different apps that let you monitor things in your home, even turn up the heat or turn up the air conditioner in your home before you get there. So it's very interesting to do a little search online to find out about the apps that help you control the environment in your home. I also have an app on my phone that has a little camera that faces my backyard. And if something goes in front of the camera, I get a notification on my phone. There happened to be a lot of squirrels on my roof, so I turned off that notification. But if I wanted to turn it on, I could actually see my backyard if I wanted to from the phone. Kindle is just one example of an app you could have on your phone or on your tablet if you want to read books. There are many different apps that allow you to store books. Kindle happens to be, not only does it work with Amazon, it also works with your library. The library lets you lend books and put them onto a device. Audible is another app that actually lets you do Audible books on your device. And some of these are free. They're not all books that you have to pay for. And I know it seems like you're never gonna read a book on your phone, but you might want to download a cookbook. So when you travel to somebody's house in Long Island and you want to make dinner that night, you have a cookbook in your hand. You don't have to, I used to tear the pages out of my cookbooks when I would go traveling to people's houses. It's a sin when you're an author. You're not supposed to do that. Um, and then they'd never make it back into the book and I'd lose that favorite recipe. But instead, you could move the cookbooks onto your Kindle and always have the cookbook with you, which I think is worth it. This one's very interesting. And now for the life of me, Shop Savvy is the name of that app. Shop Savvy lets you hold the phone up to the barcodes of an item that you're interested in purchasing. Not only will it tell you the price, but it t will tell you whether you can get it 
within a certain vicinity of you for less. It will also set up notifications that when that item goes on sale, they'll let you know that it's gone on sale. So if you don't buy it that day, you can just sort of hang on to that information until you get a notification that it's on sale. It's not the only app that does that, but Shop Savvy works very well. So that's the one that I decided to put in there. Yes? A, a little louder, I'm sorry. Right. So here, right. So she, what she said is sometimes when you download the, the, these apps, they start asking you for a lot of things. Back out of it and stop doing it. If the app has commercials, that's the price you're paying for their free service. But if they start asking you a lot, doing surveys and asking you for things you're not comfortable with, you can, like any relationship, you can step away from it any time you want to. You might have regrets afterwards and think, I really like that app, or, geez, I shouldn't have been so harsh with that app, or, oh, wait, I get confused. Am I talking about a man or an app? But I think it's, it's important to know that you're not married to any of these apps. So if the app starts misbehaving, hit the road, Jack. Say it again. Does, I, I, no, not that I've seen, but at any, and also, you know, an app can be something that doesn't have those questions initially, and then it does, because it changes, because it wants to gather information. So at any point, if you don't like the way it works, just walk away from it. Can you go to the next slide for me? It's not on there, because I just added it to the slideshow. So Shop Savvy is not on the list. You're absolutely right. You can use apps for social networking. Actually, Facebook, I think 85% of the people that use Facebook use it off of their phone and not off of their website. So you can choose to visit your social media using your app should you choose to do that. So Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram are all apps that you can have on your phone or on your tablet. But I'm gonna say this before we do any talking about that. All of social media, there are good points to it and there are bad points to it. And if you don't want to use it, I totally respect that. But if you do want to use it, I'm just going to give you one golden rule that I use, which is called the front door test. Before you put anything on social media, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, I don't care where it is, ask yourself the question, would you be comfortable taping it to the outside of the door to your home? If the answer is yes, forge ahead. If the answer is no, don't put it on Facebook, don't put it on Twitter, don't put it on Instagram because it's going out to a heck of a lot more people than would walk by the front door to your home, right? So that's really, uh, so live in New York City, I don't put on pictures. If I'm in Hawaii for two weeks, I don't put up a picture the first night there saying, the first sunset of 14 sunsets in Hawaii, I'll share one every night. Because I may as well say, I'm gone for two weeks, so break in tomorrow. Don't take the heavy stuff yet. I'm not home for another, you know, 10 days. Like, take the light stuff, cess it out, then come back again. So I don't do vacation pictures while I'm on vacation. Some people do, I don't. You know, my mother always used to say the best time to break into a house is during a wedding or a funeral because it was in the newspaper. That's what you're doing when you put your vacation pictures up in real time is you're letting people know that you're not home. So it's just important to sort of, again, this is an issue. Those of us over the age of 40 are wiser than those of us under the age of 40. Those of us under the age of 20, their frontal lobe is not fully developed. So it's not even that they're wise, they can't make sensible choices until that frontal lobe comes into full wisdom there. So when you hear about these horror stories of what have happened with kids on social media, just remember just because somebody does something stupid with social media, it doesn't mean that social media is stupid. And it won't make you stupid, right? You are the person you are, and you're wise, and you're cautious, and your privacy is probably something that you hold on to more than a younger person does. That's a generational thing. If you go to the next slide. So Instagram, I'm using this as an example. Instagram has a website. Not many people look at it online. But when you establish your account with Instagram, you need to give them an email address, and you need to make a password with them. That's true with Twitter. That's true with Facebook. Um, so sometimes it's easier to sign up on the computer and then use it on your handheld device. Because typing things like your email address or your password, it's easy to make mistakes when you're using a handheld device. Sometimes it's just easier to use a regular old keyboard. Don't hesitate to buy a stylus 
for your smartphone or tablet. That's S-T-Y-L-U-S. It has a little rubber tip on it. And for those of us, my mother always had trouble with a tablet because her fingernails were long and they'd get in the way. I had another client who her fingers were just too dry. Some men's fingers are very, very large. And those little keyboards make no sense at all. So don't hesitate to buy a stylus to tap your words out on both the smartphone and the, and the tablet. It really helps. Go to the next slide, please. So Instagram is one of those places where on Facebook people talk. They talk about their cat rolling off the side of their bed. They talk, you know, it's a lot of talking with some images. Instagram is really images. It's like, you know, a, a, a picture is worth a thousand words. That's kind of where Instagram came to be, that people post pictures sometimes with a little bit of talk underneath it. But really it's about the picture. If you could go to the next slide. So what makes Instagram fun, however, is before at the stage where you're choosing the picture that's in your photographs that you're about to post to Instagram, Instagram gives you the option to use some of their filters to make the picture look more interesting or look just plain better than it was. I love playing with the filters. And it's another point where you might then save the picture after you've altered it a little bit, save it back into your own photographs after you've made the picture, you know, enhanced it somewhat. So if you're using Instagram and you haven't ever played with the filters, you're missing something because it's actually very fun. The next slide. On Instagram, like on Facebook or like on Twitter, you can tell somebody that you appreciate their photograph. There's a place where you can click and a little heart turns red and that means that you're telling them that you like their picture. A, a bigger conversation about social media, and maybe I'll come back and do an, a social media talk, which I did a few years ago, but social media is that, it's social. If you're wanting to use it to promote something, which is fair enough, that's what people do in life, make sure that it's reciprocal. The acti it's like a dinner party, right? You don't wanna go to a dinner party and be talking about yourself the whole time. Nobody will invite you back again. With social media, if you wanna interact, that's what it's for. It's supposed to be a call back to each other. You say, I like your photograph, you chat with me about something. I say, oh, what an interesting restaurant you went to, thanks for the recommendation. So just think of the word social if you start to use social media to make it more enjoyable because that's what it's supposed to be as a two-way street. The next picture, please. So, we want to get organized with our apps. So you've gone into the app store, you've taken a bunch of apps, and you've put them onto your phone. That's called, you can upload or download an app. The word download just means moving it from one place to another. So when the temperature got hot, I downloaded my summer clothes from the top of my closet into my dresser. I uploaded my winter clothes from my dresser into the top of my closet. That's all that word means when you hear it. It just means moving it from one place to another, up or down. So now you've got a bunch of apps on your phone. And now you have buyer's remorse, even though you didn't pay for it. You've got shop savvy on your phone and you decide, I can't stand it, they changed their policies, they're driving me mad. How on earth do I get rid of it? If you haven't done this before, hold, on an iPhone, hold your finger down on the app and all of a sudden, they all start dancing. And you don't know how that happened. You're like, what? It's a great moment. Because when it starts dancing like that, it means that you can tap on the X in the top corner. It'll ask you, do you want to delete this app? And the app will go away. It also means that you can move the app. So you've got a page or two or three of apps on your phone. And you want to have one app on a different page or you want to have it on a different order, when they're shaking like that, it's the moment where you can actually reorganize where the apps go. And then when you've finished either deleting it or moving it, you press on the bottom on the, bo the bottom on the bottom of the phone, it's hard to say, the button on the bottom of the phone, and everything will stop shaking. And that's sort of how you can play around and, and move around the apps. And again, the glory of being at Senior Planet is that there's somebody here to help you do that if you haven't ever done it before. So that is why you are the lucky people that get to sit in here or other people that are the other planets. Um, it makes it much, much easier. If you could go to the next slide for me. You lock the door to your home. You don't put the key in the door and say, oh, what a pain in the neck. This takes two minutes out of my day takes two seconds out of your day to lock the door. You just lock the door because you want to lock the door because you want to protect what's inside. And then you come home and you unlock the door. And you don't say, oh, it's such a, take so much time to turn that key in my door and open the door. So why do you resist putting a passcode on your smartphone or on your tablet? 
because you're saying it's a pain in the neck that every time I pick up my phone, I'm going to have to type this in or do this to make the phone open up. I'm going to wager that if somebody broke into your home, they might steal your television set, they might find the spare cash somewhere, but they're not going to know every person's address that you know. They're not going to find the photographs of your granddaughter from her ballet class that because you didn't turn off the location services, it tells exactly where and when the classes happen. They're not going to find all of your emails and read your correspondence. Your phone has more compromising information on it than your living room does if somebody should break into your house. So my suggestion to you is if you don't have a passcode on your smartphone or on your tablet, now is the time to protect that device. And so to protect that device, it depends. You can either put in a four or six or eight character letters or numbers. On, I think it's on Androids, you can do this, you know, do a certain pattern with your finger, or now they have either fingerprint or face notifications that let the phone open up. One of those should happen on your phone. You can set it so that it takes a certain amount of minutes before you have to put that in. You know, the phone has to fall asleep first. But I highly recommend you do it. I also, with an iPhone, they have the capability, if you've activated it, to find your phone. So I dropped my phone. It came out of my back pocket. This was a couple of years ago. I had find my iPhone activated on my phone, which meant I could be on anybody's computer anywhere in the world and sign into my Apple account, and I would be able to see where my phone is on a map because it would find the phone. That's the program. It finds your phone for you. If your phone is in airplane mode, it doesn't find your phone. So if you're at an airport, that's one of the things people have lost their phones at the airport and called me and said, how do I do this? It's not working. It's because in airplane mode, your phone actually doesn't have a signal, so it can't find it. But I've had friends who lost their phone for days. I went and I looked online for them about where their phone is, and I said, the phone is in your apartment. I can see that it's in your apartment. Then you can turn on a tone, and there's an alarm that will sound, and it was under a bunch of towels in the bathroom. She must have put her phone down and then put clean towels on top of it so it was buried there. So it will find the phone. It will activate an alarm if you don't find the phone but you know the range that it's in. And it will wipe out everything on the phone if you can tell the phone is in somebody else's hands. So there's no risk of them finding what's on your phone. I, so when I lost my phone, I, was, I sat down to do something. My phone fell out of my back pocket. About a half an hour later, I realized that I lost my phone. I got on to find my iPhone, and I went to search for it, and my phone was already up in Queens. My phone has my business card on it. So had somebody found my phone and wanted to find me, they could have emailed me and said, I found your phone, and they didn't. So I figured when it was off on its way to Queens, I was never going to see it again, and so I wiped out the information on the phone just to be on the safe side, even though it had a passcode that I didn't think they could get by, but I just wanted to be on the safe side. And that's all built into the Find My iPhone program. It can either find the phone, it can so set off an alarm, or it can wipe what's on the phone off. It won't wipe away your contacts, because when you have these smartphones, your contacts aren't actually being, it's confusing, but they're not being kept on the phone. Your contacts are actually being held up in the cloud. Right? They're being stored on a server that's overseen by either your Android phone or your Apple phone. So it seems bizarre. Manhattan mini storage, right? We've all heard of Manhattan mini storage. You've got your sets of china and your extra bicycle and that you know, other piece of furniture you never used. You put it into Manhattan mini storage. That's what the cloud is to your contacts. Your contacts, they don't want to take up the space and literally live on your phone, so they actually are in the cloud, which means they're not on the phone, but you can always access them. Your phone can always go and grab your contacts, and that's how you see them. So that's why if you wipe them off of your phone, you, you don't lose your contacts because they're still being held in the cloud, this Man Manhattan mini storage for whoever you service your phone with. I know that's confusing. Don't hang on to it. Just know that you should activate Find My iPhone so that if you lose your phone, you can figure out where to get it from. Can I have the next slide? So we're coming near the end here, so I'm going to ask you if you have any questions. But first, I'm going to introduce you to my website, which is askabbystokes.com. Um, on the website, I have some 
articles that I've written, but more importantly, I have 16 videos that show you how to do things that I couldn't fit into the book, is this thing on? Ooh, what's that loud noise? Um, and yeah, and it's free. There's 16 videos, everything's free. So when I wrote this book, I couldn't fit everything in here that I wanted to fit in here. So I put the 16 videos up online and everything on my website is free for you to look at and for you to enjoy. Um, go to the next slide, please. So I also, who in here is either, has been a librarian, married to a librarian, has a relative who's a librarian, or a school teacher? There's always somebody in the room. Well, hail to those school teachers and librarians. They are the backbone of society. They are all underpaid. They all should get much more respect. They are the reason we have brains working in our heads. So I created a page on my website specifically with information to help librarians and teachers because often in your library, people go there and ask them technology questions because they have computers there. They have a computer lab and these librarians end up having to sort of halfway teach people. So if you go to the next slide, there's a list under the librarian page of all of these different handouts that I've created. You got two handouts tonight when you came. One is 100 free apps and one is an international, intergenerational idea for activities. That came off of intergenerational ideas, which is also the grandparents' cheat sheet for staying in the game. That was one of the handouts that you got. If you wanted to find other handouts, you can just go to the website. You can print them directly from my website, and it's all free. If you go to the next slide, this is just an image of the videos that I have on the website. And the next slide. And this is every video tutorial that I have has a handout below it. It says click here for a printable handout and there'll be step-by-step -step handouts that you can print that walk you through the same steps that I showed you in the online video. The next slide. We're going to stop at this one. So I also have, I've been very bad about the newsletter. I was hit by a car about four years ago and the newsletter sort of fell by the wayside, but I'm going to get back and do it. So if you want to be on my newsletter, you can sign up on my website. I won't share your information with anybody else, but I'll add you to the, to the newsletter and then you'll get it once I finally do one. Um, the, international, the intergenerational handout that I gave you, or the grandparents cheat sheet for staying in the game, I put that together because I've done these talks all across the United States. And I think I've been to 23 states. And at the end of the talks, people will say to me, you know, I love this technology, but I feel like even though I'm more in touch with my family by numbers, I feel like the value of our interactions is thinner. Text messages, emails, it's not the same as spending time with them. So I put together this list of suggestions of ways that you can take the technology that we have in front of us and use it to actually connect better with people, not more often, thicker, deeper, more significant interactions. So let's go back to Skype which could be on your smartphone, it could be on your computer, it could be on your tablet. Let's say that you are the keeper of the famous family chocolate chip cookie recipe, right? Every time the kids come to visit you, they expect to eat your chocolate chip cookies. Every time you go to them, you better bring cookies with you or else you're gonna hear about it. What if you email or text the recipe for the cookies to your grandchild who lives in California? And you say to them at five o'clock on Friday, have all of the ingredients in your kitchen and preheat your oven. You in turn will go to your house with all of the ingredients and you'll preheat your oven. And at five o'clock, you're both gonna connect with each other via Skype, which means you can see each other and speak to each other, hear each other. And you show them how to put the divot in the flour so that the eggs mix in better. And they see that the cornflakes are really the secret crunch in the cookie that nobody knew about. And you talk to each other while you make cookies with each other in real time, but you're across the country. And then once the cookies go into the oven, you can say goodbye to each other, and when they come out and they cool off, you put them in a box and you mail them their cookies, and they mail you, you mail them your cookies, and they mail you their cookies, right? That's taking the technology and using it in a way that's sort of old school with how we used to spend time with each other. So I, there's a whole list for you of different ways that you can use this technology and have a, a more full interaction with a family member rather than a lesser interaction. Here's the trick. I'm gonna stop talking for a second 
and I'm going to open the floor to questions. But because people are on YouTube, I'm going to ask you to make your questions as concise as they can be, because I'm going to be repeating the questions for you. This is the only way they're hearing, and they won't be able to hear your questions. So short and sweet, and then I'll do the answer in. Yes. I'm sorry. Say it louder. Scam. The shop savvy one that I mentioned. Yes. What's your question? Shop savvy is the name of it, right? Shop savvy. So you go to your app store, you go to the little magnifying glass, you type in shop savvy, and then it's going to come up on the list, and then you'll click on it. That's my phone saying that it is now. 7.30. Um, and so that's how you add it to your phone. So that's the name is Shop Savvy. Yes. Yes. How do all of these app manufacturers or designers make money? Advertising. So there are two things happening. They're either the advertisers that support the apps. Well, so actually, if I, if I created an app, I would sell it to the app store. So that's the way their, their initial payment is through s getting it listed onto the store. So people will buy your app idea from you. And s I only talked about free apps. Most apps cost money, between 99 cents up to $100 or more for something. A lot of apps run advertising. So advertisers are paying to be on your app, especially if it's a very popular app. And um, if an app gathers information from the people who use it, that demographic information is also sold to marketers. So there's several ways that they can monetize an app should you design one. But the very first step is if you designed an app, you're going to sell it to the app store if you just let give up your rights to it, and they're going to do what they will with it. Yeah, so it actually can be quite lucrative if it's popular. So if I have an iPhone, I, on my phone I've got my photographs, I've got my contacts, I have access to my email. I have access to my email when I'm on my computer. So that email account didn't go anywhere, right? So your email still exists. Your contacts I have access to when I'm on a computer as well, so they still exist. Even my photographs are stored on iCloud. So even though it feels like all that information lives on your phone, and when you wipe out your phone, it's gone, it's really not. When you get a new phone and replace it, you're going to sign into your iCloud account, and all of that stored information will then appear on your phone. Yes, so you, you, uh, you would choose whatever, pa he asked if it would have the same passcode. You'll choose whatever passcode it is that you want to put onto the new phone. The way you sign in to your stored emails and your contacts and your photographs is through your email address and the password there, not the passcode on the phone. So it's all actually being stored somewhere else. You can pull it onto the new device. And that's exactly when you want to go into a store and have somebody help you do it, or come here and have somebody help you do it, because it's fairly complex, but it doesn't take very long. It can just be a little overwhelming. Yes? How often, well, to be honest with you, I haven't done it for probably two years. But he said, how often do I publish the newsletter? I used to do it once a month, and I haven't. But I'm hoping come fall I will get back to doing it at least once a month. That would be my goal. But I had to recover from this car accident, so I sort of got derailed. Did you raise your hand? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yes. So exactly. I'll, I'll say it again because it is complex, and it's totally understandable that it's confusing. Should you have Find My iPhone as an app that you've activated, and you've lost your phone, you're going to go to a computer, and you're going to sign in using uh, its iCloud, which isn't confused with the cloud. That's why it's so confusing. But you have an account with your phone. You're going to sign into that account. And then that account is, will be accessed by the computer you're looking at, and it will find where your phone is. Or if it doesn't find it, you can wipe everything off of it. Yes? And Android has the same thing, and I don't remember what it's called. But they have, if you search for Find My Phone, you'll find what the app is on the Android. I don't remember what it's called. But they do have something similar to that. 
Yes. Cookies. Ah, Hansel and Gretel, right? They're heading into the woods, and they want to find their way home. And so they leave a little trail of breadcrumbs to find their way back. Cookies are just the same thing. You visit a website, you buy a book about Agatha Christie, and you buy a cookbook. And if the cookies are activated on that website, when you go back to the website the next time, it's going to have something different on the screen than it is for you than for me. It's going to show another Agatha Christie novel. Because when you visited the website and you bought the Agatha Christie book, it left a little breadcrumb behind in the brain of your computer. And it happens so fast that when Abby's going to go back to buy another book, I remember she bought Agatha Christie. I'm going to put that up on the screen. So cookies are little pieces of information left behind on the brain of the computer that allows them to customize your experience when you come back to the website. So there's a positive to it, and there's a negative to it. Because it means they're kind of tracking your activity, but it also means that they're customizing your experience, so it might be a better experience for you. That's what a cookie is. Any other questions? So yes? And loud, because you're. I, I do. She asked if I go to other libraries. I haven't actually done any libraries in New York in a long time. There was a time that I was going to a lot, but I haven't been. Um, I have. A, I do have a Facebook page. Is there? Is there another slide to go to? Go to the next slide. So I am on Facebook under AskAbbyStokes.com. So you can always, I always put things on my Facebook account if I'm doing something. This was on the Facebook account. Um, I generally, if I'm better about my newsletter, I'd be putting it in my newsletter. Um, or you can also email me at abby at askabbystokes.com. Um, and there's one more slide before we do our raffle, which has nothing to do with this, but it has a lot to do with me. So I'm going to deviate for one moment. I wrote a play. I did. I wrote a play. I wrote a solo performance piece that's actually autobiographical. Um, and it's being performed at the Cherry Lane Theater in September. And so the Cherry Lane Theater is just on Commerce Street down in the village. It's a beautiful, historic, I love that theater. It's so adorable. So I am there on September 7th. The 15th is a matinee, the 17th, 18th, and 19th at 7 o'clock at night. If you want more information, you can just go to my website, not the Ask Abby Stokes website. That's for computers, just the abbystokes.com, and you can find information about it. So essentially, the tagline for the show is, let's review the men that my mother had sex with in the summer of 1961. My parents were martini drinking swingers, and my paternity's always been in question. So that is the gist of what the play is about. So I would love it if you guys, you know, come on down. So you can go through my website to get tickets. Um, and they have been selling very well, so grab tickets grab tickets fast. Speaking of tickets, has anybody come into the room later than when I started and doesn't have a raffle ticket? Okay, so there are two of you without raffle tickets. Hang on a second. I'm going to try to do this this way. So a raffle ticket. We're raffling off two copies of my book, which is called, Is This Thing On? A computer handbook for can I remember? A friendly guide to everything digital for newbies, technophobes, and the kicking and screaming. So does everybody have a raffle ticket? OK, then we're going to start the raffle. So in a random way, since it's not inside a bowl, I'm going to just pick a ticket and call the number out. And the ticket is 870088. 